It is a great privilege and honor for me to be back again at Oxygen and to participate with such a distinguished team of speakers. And it is my task today to open our topic. We are basing our talks on the Gospel by John. And so it would be a good idea to get the purpose of that Gospel into our heads. So I'm going to read from chapter 20 and verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John states his purpose to be persuasive evangelism. He is writing in order that people will come to believe several facts. Facts that are so powerful that believing them leads to eternal life. To believe that Jesus is Hamashiach, the Messiah, expected by the Jews. To believe he is the Son of God. And to lead to life through believing in his name. Now because that is the status purpose of the book, we would expect all these things to be explained. But the first thing to grasp is this. That John's gospel is a book of signs. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded. But these are that you might believe. And so the first vastly important thing is this, that Christianity is an evidence-based faith. It is not a delusion. It is not a leap in the dark. And this came into evidence when I was last in Melbourne debating your famous Professor Peter Singer. I told the audience at the beginning, quite honestly, that my parents were Christian and my grandparents and so on. And he got up and he said, well, there goes my biggest objection to any kind of faith. People stay in the faith in which they've been brought up. But I thought I'm going to have some fun with this. So when I got the chance to speak, I said, Peter, I told them about my parents. Would you like to tell them about yours? Were they atheists? Yes, he said. Oh, I said, that's very interesting. You stayed in the faith in which you were brought up. <laughs> oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, I'm sorry, Peter. I thought you believed it. <laughs> now, that is fascinating, isn't it? This is one of the world's leading philosophers who does not see that his atheism is a belief system. They accuse us of having a belief system, of having a faith, and their idea of faith is believing where there's no evidence. So by definition, because they think their atheism is based on evidence, it's not a belief system. And that's one of the battles we're engaged in, to get across the fact that Christians are people whose trust in God is based on solid and convincing evidence. And John has this book of signs. Mind you, of course, there are people like A.C. Grayling, who to my amazement, he's a philosopher in London, said, you know, Jesus expects us to believe without evidence. He quotes a couple of verses before the ones I read where Jesus says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So says Grayling. There it is. Jesus expects people to believe without evidence. Can he not read? Because what it says here is, blessed are those that have not seen and yet believed. Seeing is only one kind of evidence. Christ never said, blessed are those who have had no evidence and yet believed. It's those that haven't seen. None of us in this room 
have seen Jesus Christ as the apostles did. And yet we have many grounds for believing, including the entire book of signs, which is John's Gospel. If A.C. Grayling had bothered to read the next verse from the one he quoted, he wouldn't have made the mistake. But then I notice in our opponents, they're not very good at taking Scripture seriously. They constantly demand evidence, but when it's offered... They don't even take the trouble or have the courtesy to read it. So what we're dealing with is the most profound set of claims ever made in human history. Where Jesus claims to be, I am, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the resurrection, the life, I am the shepherd, I am the bread of life. And they're credible claims. Because they are evidence-based. Of course, this stands in direct challenge to the contemporary worldview. And the world today attacks two basic features of the Christian message that it attacked from the very beginning. The first is, it's supernaturalism. Jesus claims to be the Son of God. He claims there is another world. He claims to have come down from that world. And of course, in the West at least, the dominant worldview is naturalism. There is no other world. We ought to notice though that the very first attack on the Christian faith according to the book of Acts was through the Sadducees who were religious leaders who didn't believe in the supernatural. It's nothing new. And the attack has continued right through the ages. The second major attack is the exclusive claims of Christianity. The early apostles preached that there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And it was not ignorance of other religions and philosophies that was behind their preaching of Christ as the only way of salvation. It was the exact opposite. They knew far more about other religions and mythologies than we do today. And so the Gospel of John is full of signs. The Greek word for sign is semion, from which we get semiotics, giving meaning, giving the depth to the meaning of the things he did. I am the bread of life, he multiplied bread. I am the resurrection of the life, life, he raised Lazarus. And these are signs pointing to what his claims actually mean. What does it mean to say Jesus is the Messiah? What does it mean to say he's the Son of God? What does it mean to believe on him and have life in his name? We would expect John to explain these things. We would also expect him to do it in an ordered way, and of course he does. So let's take the cue from the signs. If this is a book of signs, what is the first sign in the sequence? And you will know it is the story of Jesus turning water into wine at Cana of Galilee. Richard Dawkins challenged me in this when he was describing my faith in God and he said, we all know John Lennox. He actually believes that Jesus turned water into wine. And I made the point to him, I said, Richard, if Jesus had already created water, turning it into wine may not be such a big deal as you think. (laughs) But be that as it may, the first sign in John chapter 2 is the turning of water into wine at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. And notice what John says its effect was. Chapter 2, verse 11 says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed on him. Remember, this is a book giving evidence on which faith can be based on which the step of faith can be made. And here's the first sign, and exactly as we would expect, what Jesus did 
in Cana of Galilee led his disciples to trust him, to believe in him. And I take it that that is the end of the first section of John because then you have a little general statement after this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples and there they stayed for a few days. So I think that the first big section of John begins in chapter 1 verse 1 and ends in chapter 2 verse 11. It starts with the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It ends with a wedding. And when the wine ran out, the incarnate Creator turned the water into the best wine. You'd be very dull not to perceive the hint, the very big hint, that he was fulfilling in part what would one day happen in the future messianic age when, I quote Isaiah 25, God will make unto all nations a feast of wines on the lees well refined, a feast at which death shall be swallowed up forever and the tears wiped from all faces. A prophecy which John in the Revelation says, will be fulfilled in the glorious events surrounding the marriage supper of the Lamb, the making of a new heaven and a new earth, and the wiping away of all tears. This is the meta-narrative of history, of course. The first section of John, starting in the beginning with creation and ending with a wedding which is a new beginning and projecting off into the future, into the world to come, which will begin with a wedding. It's the biggest story ever told. Isn't it wonderful to have a big story into which to insert your life? I often think of the atheist, the tininess of that worldview, that gives you a space of 70 years more or less, and that's it. But this stretches from the beginning to a new beginning and to all eternity. It's a big story. The question is, is it true? And John, in this first section, I believe, enlarges our mind and stretches them out to begin to grasp just how big the story of Jesus is. And I want to paint the picture for you a little bit as we commence this conference. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It's a series of ontological statements about the way things are, existence statements. In the beginning was the Word, that is, the Word already was. So we start with the eternal Word of God. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and immediately our minds lose their poise and their balance. Who will explain that to us? The Word was with God, the Word was God. God was with God. Does that make any sense? Well, we shouldn't dismiss it too rapidly. Because, of course, what it's saying is that God is a fellowship We have a tiny example of that. I have a wife, one wife, and I've been married to her for 46 years, and we two are a fellowship, two-person fellowship. That's just a tiny picture of the bigger thing. God is eternally a fellowship. He's big enough to have a relationship within himself. To put it crudely, God wasn't hard up for someone to talk to and so made a few humans to chat to. No, no. God is an eternal fellowship of father and son. And as T.F. Torrance, the famous Scottish theologian, pointed out, the Trinity, the word doesn't occur in the New Testament, is not so much a Christian formulation as the way God has revealed himself. God is complex, ladies and gentlemen. You're complex enough. You've probably discovered that. If you haven't, your wife or your husband or your children or all the rest of you have. And God is no less complex, infinitely complex. And he reveals himself as a trinity 
of persons, a fellowship. And of course that will become enormously important. These things are so big that I stand in all before them. That that fellowship, we shall see in a moment, is prepared to extend itself to as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children of God. The fellowship that is God extends. And if we trust Jesus as Lord and Saviour, it extends even to you and to me. Now, of course, John now answers the burning question of our day among the philosophers and scientists. Why is there something rather than nothing? And the answer, in brief, is because God caused it to exist. But you see, the philosophers and scientists have a problem, ladies and gentlemen. They don't believe in God, and their science tells them the universe began with nothing, so they're stuck. How do you get something for nothing? And I'm giving lectures all the time now about nothing. It's a most interesting topic, nothing. <laughs> and the nonsense which people talk about. Lawrence Krauss, who I believe visited you last year, writes in his book, because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it to be the absence of something. What? <laughs> That's sheer nonsense. And I could go on, but I've written about these things, so I'm not going to go on. Let's not be wowed by claims that the universe can generate itself from nothing. I had a debate at MIT Harvard Faculty Club last year with the father of modern cosmology and the inventor of the theory of inflation, Alan Guth. And at the end of it, it was a very friendly debate, I said to Alan, you know, out there, everybody wants to know what nothing is. Now, I said to him, when you, as a physicist and cosmologist, talk about nothing, you don't mean nothing in the ordinary sense of absence of anything. I went down into Sydney and I met nobody. Doesn't mean I met somebody who was called nobody. It means I didn't meet anybody. No, he said, we don't. Thank you, I said, very much indeed. They're trying to fog your mind, ladies and gentlemen, in thinking that they've solved the problem. They haven't solved it because the only solution to it is here. That God caused the universe to be. And of course, God is spirit. He's not mass energy, he's not physical. And here we come to this huge claim in the Gospel of John. Through him all things were made, the NIV says. But actually what it says is this. Through him all things came to be. And without him nothing came to be that came to be. God is eternal, he never came to be. The universe is not eternal, it came to be. Now this is very important, because the extra little clause, without him, nothing came to be that came to be. Have you ever wondered why that's there? Well, let me make one suggestion. The heart of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, is what he thinks is a knockdown argument if you claim that God created the universe, then you must ask who created God. Do you know that argument? Who created the creator that created the creator? It sounds marvelous. It's childishly foolish, actually. Because if you say, well, think about it. Logical analysis on a Monday afternoon, is that okay? Right. Who created X? What do those words mean? Well, they assume that X is created. So if you say, who created the creator, you're assuming the creator is created. So you're excluding all uncreated creators. So you're excluding the God of the Bible. So the question doesn't even address the existence of an eternal God, far from refuting it. And you see, John's got it here. Without him, nothing came to be that came to be. I find this fascinating. Because, you see, if the Creator came to be, he's one of the things that came to be, and according to John, he could only come to be by the Word. So the Word came to be through the Word, which is nonsense, of course. 
It's there in Scripture. Such a foolish argument, but it's got a sharp tail, which I use from time to time. And I put it to Richard Dawkins, you believe this is a sensible question? Certainly is, of course, if you're talking about created God. So let me try it on you. You believe the universe created you. Okay, then. Who created your creator? I've been waiting for seven years to get an answer to that. This is so important. These basic truths that are being assailed today. The status of our universe. That is what is at stake here. And the amazing thing is that the claim is that it came to be through God the Creator. So then we are being told that the universe is not the ultimate reality. God is the ultimate reality. My atheist friends also have an ultimate reality. It's mass, energy, the universe, or the multiverse. It's one or the other. The question is which evidence fits. And the beginning of the foundation of hope is this. That the man who was on earth 20 centuries ago, Jesus Christ, was the word who spoke the universe into existence. But not only that, these staggering words, it was created by him and for him. All will one day flow into him. This universe is a big place, ladies and gentlemen. It was created for him. What a wonderful story to get our minds and hearts into as we start our conference. Universal implications for all of history. These statements are not statements merely expressing subjective devotion. They are statements about what is factually the case. They are objective truth. They are not claiming merely that Jesus was unique in the degree to which he as a human being was close to God. That is not faith, but it's opposite, sheer unbelief. John is claiming, as we shall see in a moment, that Jesus was the Word incarnate. The Word in creation. Genesis 1, of course, unpacks that idea. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. The universe was created through a series of speech acts. God speaking. When I speak and say, let there be light, nothing happens. Unless you happen to be standing by a light switch at the door. When God says, let there be light, light is invented and comes to be. And step by step, God has built a world. And we ought to remind ourselves that the pinnacle of the steps, human beings made in the image of God, uniquely so. The heavens declare the glory of God. They are not made in His image. You are. What a dignity that gives to us. An immense dignity as creatures. Now, of course, I'm tempted as a scientist to say a lot more. Because I believe that God has left his signature in the universe. Firstly, in the way, in the fact that we can do science, that the universe is mathematically describable. But actually, physically, in our cells, he's left, ironically, the longest word that we've ever discovered, the DNA code. 3.5 billion letters long. And I smile sometimes at my colleagues. The moment they see their own name written somewhere, five letters long, they recognize intelligent input. And they, and they stare at the DNA code that's three and a half billion letters long and they solemnly say, chance and the laws of nature. Something's going on, isn't it? You see, it's a perception. We perceive it. God hasn't left himself without evidence. But we must move on. John begins at the beginning, and he says that in him, verse 4, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. He's still talking about creation, of course. 
And we look at life at all its levels. And everybody asks, where does it come from? And thousands of books are written on the topic. Why is it important where life comes from? Oh, yes, it is. Who shall give us light on life? And John is telling you that life is a light. Life is a light. At all of its levels. And it points in one direction and in one direction only. It points to the existence of a life giver. And ladies and gentlemen, let me put it in the negative to make myself clear. If you try to explain life without God, ultimately you will end up in the dark. Physical life points to its ultimate source in God, the Creator. And now we come to the age of the prophets, culminating in John. We're coming down through history. Do you notice the chronology of it? John came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. Here it comes again. The whole purpose of having light is that people may come to see, which is one of the metaphors John uses for believing Christ. Seeing it. And you need witness in order to be able to see it. And John was a witness to the light. He wasn't the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And as Paul points out in Romans, everybody's got some light. The light of creation, ladies and gentlemen, is so powerful, according to Paul, that if we reject it, we're without excuse. The invisible thing, of him, are clearly seen from the foundation of the world through the things that are made so that they are without excuse. He's given us the light of creation, the light of conscience, the light of scripture. All of these energized by God's spirit. All of them evidences that can stimulate human response to believe so that if people don't believe, they can be judged for not believing. Because they've gone against evidence that was available. And now he's in the world. See, we've come down from creation through the age of the prophets. The light's coming into the world and now he's in the world. And he'd made the world. And they didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what they never were before, children of God. Notice the condition. To those who did receive him, some didn't, some did. And it is our responsibility as human beings being given by God this marvelous faculty that distinguishes us from the animals, the capacity to choose, the capacity to love, the capacity to say yes or no, to say it to God, that we choose God and suddenly something happens. And we trust Christ and we become not creatures of God, but children of God. The fellowship expands itself to include us. An amazing thing, is it not? Born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. That's not a metaphor. Merely, it is telling us that a real spiritual birth has taken place. It is a metaphor in the sense that it's not talking about born at the literalistic sense. But don't be deceived, as Lewis has pointed out so often. Metaphors usually stand for something real. And this regeneration, this new birth, is a real experience of God. Where we move from death to life. Where we receive the very life of God himself. God has not made us deterministic robots, has he? He's made us capable of real relationships, which we use every day to trust some people and not to trust others. And the whole battle from my heart and your heart constantly is, am I going to trust God or not? Am I going to trust his word or not? 
And the biggest pressure on us, as Jonathan pointed out in his introduction, in our society is to do everything to undermine our confidence in God and his word. The biggest problems I come across in life are two, fear and shame. The moment we begin to have our confidence in God and his word undermined, that's a step towards the privatization of our faith and losing the cutting edge of our witness eventually completely. So I'm thrilled you're all here because that's a sign that you don't want that to happen in your country or in your own life and heart. Many of you are pastors and teachers and what your congregations are looking for is courage and confidence and answers to questions. The main reason in the United Kingdom for people leaving churches is they don't answer our questions. And in America, the United States, I'm told, that of young people professing Christianity going into college, 70 to 80% have lost it in three years. We're in a serious situation. That's why we need a positive injection of the Word of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The Word never came to be. The universe came to be. The Word came to be human. That's awesome, isn't it? Here we stand before the profoundest mystery in the whole of human experience and history that the Word who never came to be came to be human. I was once lecturing a whole lot of Atomic physicists, about 800 of them in one room. Pretty radioactive lot, I should think. (laughs) And after I'd finished lecturing, one of them came up to me and he said, Professor Lennox, that was a very interesting lecture about design and so on, but I detect that you're a Christian. He was quite sharp, you see. (laughs) So he said, now, come off it. You're a mathematician and this is the 21st century. Now, if you're a Christian... You're obliged to believe that Jesus was both God and human. I said, that's right. He said, can you explain that to me? Well, I said, you've been asking all the questions. Let me ask you one or two first. Are you agreeable to that? He said, that'll be fine. So I said, tell me, what is consciousness? A little pause, and he said, I don't know. I said, okay, let's go on to something easy. Um, I said, what is energy? Well, he said, we can measure it and we can use it. I said, you heard my question, what is it? A longer pause. I don't know, he said. Oh, I said, that's interesting. And you believe in consciousness, do you, and energy? Yes, he said, I do. You don't know what they are. Well, I said, that's very interesting. Should I write you off as an intellectual? He said, please don't. But I said, you were going to write me off, weren't you? Three minutes ago, you were going to write me off because I couldn't explain to you something that's infinitely deeper than the nature of energy or consciousness. He said, I think we need to talk. I said, we do. I said, tell me, why do you believe in consciousness and energy when you don't know what they are? That was a bit difficult. So being kind, I helped him out. And I said to him, I think one of the reasons is because of the explanatory power of these concepts. Oh, he said, that's right, that's right. (laughs) Even scientists grasp at straws, you know. (laughs) So I said, of course, I cannot explain to you how Jesus is simultaneously God and man. We don't even know what light is, gravity is, energy is. The simple things in the universe. Of course I can't explain it to you. But I've got grounds for believing it. Because the only explanation of Jesus Christ that makes sense is that he's simultaneously God and human. He said, I accept that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to switch the topic just for a moment, but I'm not switching it. 
One of the biggest challenges in our society today is not simply the status of the universe. It's the status of human life. Is it made in the image of God or not? And Peter Singer, among others, is accusing us of speciesism. That is, of allocating to humanity a species speciality that's not deserved, and that's the cause of all the trouble. I think he's disastrously wrong. There's a lot of debate, even among Christians about the historicity of our first parents. Let me give you my biggest reason for believing humans are special. God became one. And if you believe that God became human, ladies and gentlemen, and really get it into your heart, you might have less difficulty and accepting that there was a special creation at the beginning of humanity. The doctrine of the incarnation is beyond human understanding, but it's not beyond human acceptance. And it has enormous implications. And think of that verse in Colossians. Written, what, 55 A.D.? After Jesus has ascended, you read this thrilling statement. In him dwells, not dwelt, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It is still the case. These are very big things, aren't they? But that's good. We got a big story. That's why I'm not ashamed of it. And nor should you be. You get this nowhere else. Nothing as big as this that is evidence for it so that we can believe in it. And John testifies of him. He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. That will be taken up later in the gospel. Out of his fullness we have all received grace and place of grace already given because the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law, with all its divine necessity of exposing our sin, could never cure it. It says nowhere in Scripture, to all who received Moses, they became children of God. No. But through Jesus came grace. And the truth about the grace, that when the law exposes our sinful guiltiness, The light shines on a cross. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Grace and truth meet in Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, says John, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So now, briefly, I want you to notice a sequence of days. Because from verse 19 to 28, we discover that John is questioned by various people who want to know who he is. And at the end of that, you will discover um, in verse, uh, uh, verse 35, the next day John was there again. And then in verse 43, the next day. And in chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day. And if you can count, you see that there have been three already. So it can't be the third day. That's intriguing, isn't it? It's the third day after the previous ones. It's the seventh day. I'm sure you've heard talks about the seven days of Genesis, haven't you? Have you ever heard one about the seven days of John? This is a sequence, deliberately so. And it takes us through. It explores some of the big things that will happen and have already happened in earth's history. And I just want to indicate them to you so that you can see the big story. 
John says that he is the voice. So, the first part of this sequence starts with the word, and this balanced by the voice. And we should listen to the voice coming from Isaiah that says that all flesh is grass, temporary and fleeting, but the message of the voice is what? The word of the Lord endures forever. The very word that opens up this gospel, now the voice is reminding us that the word of the Lord endures forever. So we need to listen to the voice. And John was uniquely positioned to point the way to Jesus. Alienation from God has turned the world into a desert. So that's where we start. That's where he started. Not simply in a physical desert, but in a moral, spiritual, and intellectual one. Where Isaiah started when the nation had rebelled against God. And then the next day, we are told that John said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples followed him, they <clears throat> heard him say this. They followed Jesus, and turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Jesus is the Lamb of God. You'll notice he changes the present tense. And of course, it's referring to the cross ultimately. So now we've come from creation through the prophets to the incarnation, and now we're turning around to look to the future. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's magnificent, of course. But I want you to think of this. Jesus turned around and saw these two men, two human beings, And now come the first recorded words of God incarnate. What do you want, he said. What do you want? What would you do if God incarnate were to come here this afternoon and say to you, What do you want? It's startling. It's so unbelievable that God, who invented the atom, created water, and the human mind would stand on our planet, and the first thing he utters to two men is, what do you want? You need to be careful with your answer because God's asking you today in this conference and me what do you really want John standing in front of me what do you want that's something to be prayed about and meditated about not to be answered in a flash putting it crudely Saying, I want a new surfboard isn't going to sound impressive. What do you want? They didn't really know what to say. And they said, well, where are you staying? Well, come and see. So they came and they dwelt with him that day. And Andrew went and found Simon, and said, we found the Messiah. They brought him to Jesus. And Jesus said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter Stone. Oh, it's fascinating, isn't it? What is this? Well, Peter himself explains it to us. To whom coming as a living stone, you are built up as spiritual stones to be a spiritual house. A dwelling for God and the Spirit is talking about the foundation of the church, isn't it? You see, if you ask God incarnate where he's dwelling, it's not number six High Street. You see, Peter's name change is the deeper answer to the question, where are you dwelling, those two men said. They hadn't the ghost of a notion. 
that he wanted to dwell in them. So we've had the cross. And now we have the church, haven't we? And we're told that he is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, the foundation of the church. It's fascinating, isn't it? We're going inexorably through history. Seeing some of it in the past and some of it from the writer's perspective in the future and pinning little things along the way that are so marvelously encouraging. And then, well, I'd better go quickly because I'm about to step on very thin ice now. You see, there's a conversion of Nathaniel. Under the fig tree. You remember that? And Jesus saw him under the fig tree. And said, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And of course, guile is the name of Jacob. He was the guilely one. That's what his name means. A genuine Israelite, in whom there is no Jacob. And Jesus said, You believe, because I told you this. You shall see greater things. You shall see the heavens open." and the angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. When do you think that's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen? Isn't it interesting, at least, that he talks about the cross, he talks about Pentecost, he talks about the church, and now he talks about a genuine Israelite. Now I'm stepping on very thin theological ice here, but I'm going to skate fast. I hear some people say to me, well, all these promises in the Old Testament, the Messiah and the kingdom, they all simply apply to the Christian church, do they? Well, you say, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, that's right. And in Christ there is neither male nor female, ladies and gentlemen. Let me use a common argument on that. Before Christianity came, there were men and women. But now that Christianity has come, there's absolutely no difference between a man and a woman. Will you buy that? Of course not. In Galatians, Paul is talking about the basis of the gospel. There's not a male chauvinist gospel and a feminist gospel or a Jewish gospel and a Greek gospel. There's only one gospel. He's saying nothing about the role. And in Romans, he says, Has God cast off his people? That is Israel. And the answer is not, don't be silly, Paul. We've now got the church. The answer is this. I am a Hebrew. Not I was one. And God is going to do big things in the future. But as I say, it's thin theological ice. And if you don't like that, you better go to sleep. (laughs) But I see a movement. But now we come to the final thing. The final thing's a wedding, ladies and gentlemen. In Cana of Galilee. And Jesus was there. And he took the religious water of purification, which they discarded because the marriage feast was over and they're now having fun. And the joy ran out of their fun. There was no more wine. Like the joy has run out of thousands of weddings since. Is it running out of yours? What causes the joy to run out of marriage? Well, they were jars of purification, weren't they? Does that tell me anything? What will mess up your marriage or anybody's marriage? is impurity. And in this contemporary world, we're only one click from disaster. It's a very difficult world for our young people, isn't it? One mouse click from disaster. Oh, how we need the help of God here. But Jesus, you see, is doing a sign. He takes what they'd rejected, the religious stuff over. Chilly water of purification. Don't talk about religion at the wedding feast, please. You'll spoil the fun. 
And he turns it into the best wine so that they gladly drank it. He got it inside them by transforming it. And of course, it's a brilliant enacted parable, even though it's a literal miracle as well. How Christ transforms marriages at the beginning and on the way by bringing up the question of purification. We're a big crowd, aren't we? I can't believe there's not a man here like myself who might need to say sorry to his wife. Could you? When was the last time you said it? You're perfect then? I have no right to speak to the wise, but ladies and gentlemen, this is serious. Serial divorces are destroying our society. We're bringing up a generation of children that don't know love. And it's infecting the Christian church. Because we don't face this question that Jesus causes us to face here. That what wrecks relationships is deceit and impurity. Isn't it wonderful that there is grace? Oh, but now let me turn to something magnificent. Do you know, I've been to many weddings, I'm sure you have. It's a very dangerous thing for a woman to outshine the bride, isn't it? One of the guests. You imagine a wedding where a guest woman comes in dressed in an even more magnificent wedding dress than the girl who's being married. You wouldn't do that, ladies, would you? You don't outshine the bride. But now listen to what John says about this wedding. I read it. It says this. Jesus, at this wedding, did the first of his signs and revealed his glory. Not the glory of the bride. Why was that? Because, ladies and gentlemen, he was looking for a bride at the wedding. He got one. Oh, what a story this is. The disciples saw it, saw his glory, found it attractive, and they trusted him. And he took another big step on the way to glory that will one day see them. Joining in that wedding feast. Christ so enormously big. That he's the male and all believers collectively form the female. Adam and Eve on a cosmic scale. Is that big enough for you? Well, if it's big enough, we'd better invest our lives in it, hadn't we? Think of that wedding that's going to happen. I sometimes think... When I get there, and if I go together with my wife, which would be delightful, I might just put my arm round her and as glory dawns on us, I'll say, Sally, if I'd known it was going to be like this, I would have invested more in it. God bless you all.